kindness and compassion. Not the top priorities, according to one noblewoman discipline reigns supreme. And Alicia Williams, with her unwavering sense of order, would never tolerate any commoners who couldn't keep up. Alicia? Oh, she's the villainess in this girl's favorite autumn game, known for tormenting the heroine. But rather than despising her, our protagonist admired her sharp tongue and relentless attitude. The heroine? Too sugary for her taste, what with her angelic smile and knack for manipulating the prince's feelings. While her friends dreamed of becoming the adored heroine, she knew that if given the chance, she'd much rather be the villainess. And then, it hit her she is the villainess. Reincarnated as the seven-year-old Alicia, daughter of the prestigious Williams family, she was no longer the meek child she once was. Instead, she saw this as her opportunity to be the most legendary villainess in history. Alicia darted down the hallway past her bewildered mother and maid. Gone was the lazy girl of yesterday. She had big plans, starting with sword training from her brothers. Henry, the stern one, scoffed, thinking it was another whim. Alan, the playful one, laughed it off as typical. Only sweet Albert agreed to teach her if she could complete 100 sit-ups and 50 push-ups daily for a week. No problem, she thought, as she dashed off. Next up, magic. Alicia knew that mastering the arcane arts, especially with her family's dark magic pedigree, was essential. However, the Williams Library was surprisingly lacking in magic books. Undeterred, she grabbed a book on plants instead, figuring she'd need more than just magic to be the ultimate villainess. She learned about fever curing herbs, glowing flowers, and flying trees. So engrossed was she in these strange new discoveries that she lost track of time. Who knew botany could be so villainously fun? Turns out Alicia's brain was top tier when it came to academics, but her body? Not so much. After barely squeezing out 50 shaky push-ups, she realized physical prowess wasn't in the cards for her at least not naturally. But ambition waits for no one, so she kept pushing through. To her surprise, the next day, those push-ups and sit-ups were a breeze. By the end of seven days, she'd leveled up dramatically 300 push-ups, 500 sit-ups, and a library's worth of knowledge crammed into her head. She was a training machine, and her progress had the whole family on edge. Her father, Arnold, couldn't help but ask what had possessed her, especially with the whole waking up early thing. Alicia, now radiating suspiciously good vibes, smiled and assured him she was just fine. She knew she was giving off major, plotting something evil energy, which only made her giddier. After all, no one would believe she remembered a past life as a villainous enthusiast. When her mother mentioned that Albert was out touring the Magic Academy preparing for his upcoming enrollment, it meant her sword training had to wait. But Alicia didn't let that slow her down. By the time her brothers returned, they were with all the other noble heirs who would soon be conquerable routes in the game. There was Eric of the Hudson family with fiery red hair and, of course, fire magic. Finn from the Smith family, a light magic prodigy. Gale of the Wind wielding Evan's family, and Curtis from the Kenwood family with green magic and outlier not from the five great noble families. And then, there was Prince Duke Seeker, heir to the throne, water magic user, and the guy destined to end up with the game's heroine in the good ending. Alicia. She was totally into him in her past life, but romance was for the heroine. She had bigger plans like making her mark as the world's greatest villainess. When Alicia ran up to greet them, her brothers introduced her to the group, who all found her adorable. Internally, she was melting at their good looks, but externally? This was her moment. She couldn't let the world's future villainess be seen as some bumbling child. With perfect grace, she curtsied, and the boys were genuinely impressed especially since her brothers had painted her as a bit of a wild child. Duke, however, was less captivated, more focused on the boys showing off their sword skills. Cue Alicia, reminding them that today was the day they'd promised to teach her. Her brothers brushed her off, clearly not taking her seriously. So, what did she do? She grabbed Albert's sword, kicked a tree, made a fruit fall, and sliced it in half with zero effort. Don't underestimate me, she declared, now basking in the astonished looks of her brothers. Duke, who had previously been aloof, 
was finally paying attention, picking up the sliced fruit with a smile. Looks like she'd made her impression. A year into her sword training, Alicia was still stuck in the endless loop of practice swings, all because her brother insisted swordsmanship was pointless if she couldn't hold a sword for hours on end. Honestly, if she weren't on a mission to become the world's greatest villainess, she'd have quit ages ago. The only silver lining. Prince Duke had been making regular visits to their house, and let's just say, she didn't mind the royal eye candy. One day, mid-break, Duke approached and casually asked if she was done for the day. It was the first time he'd spoken to her directly, which was, a moment. She replied she was just resting, and he asked why she worked so hard at swordsmanship. She almost blurted out her grand plan to become a villainess but caught herself, instead saying, I'm aiming for a villainously strong grip. He chuckled nervously clearly not prepared for that, then patted her on the head, which instantly turned her into a flustered mess. Enter Albert, and Duke quickly stepped back, apologizing for interrupting her training. Albert wasn't buying it. Afterward, he grilled Duke on why he'd been hanging around so much lately. At first, he thought it was for the books, but now he was starting to suspect the prince had a thing for his little sister, who, of course, was already swooning. Meanwhile, King Luke was busy with the kingdom's vips, discussing the crumbling state of Lona Village. Apparently, living conditions there had been spiraling, but rushing in aid wasn't the best move politically. Instead, they shifted focus to finding the legendary Golden Rose, hoping it could bring a much-needed dose of optimism to the kingdom. The conversation eventually turned to Alicia, who had become quite the social butterfly, receiving invitations to various noble estates. Her father, Arnold, still couldn't wrap his head around her sudden shift from being a self-centered little terror to a well-mannered, book-obsessed mystery. At one such tea party at Finn's estate, Alicia walked into the guest room, only to find the whole autumn game cast assembled and a suspicious map laid out before them. Panic set in was the plot fast-forwarding to her character's exile already. Before she could spiral, King Luke himself entered the room, asking to speak with her. Seriously, what was going on? The king threw her a curvy ball, asking what she thought about the kingdom of Durkee's current state. At first, Alicia was confused why on earth would the king be asking an eight-year-old about politics. Then it clicked this was a villainous test. She channeled her inner mastermind, pointing out that while the kingdom was economically strong, the wealth gap between nobles and commoners was ridiculous. People in Lona, she noted, could barely afford bread. Tensions were high, and a rebellion seemed inevitable. The king, clearly intrigued, pushed further, asking how she'd fix it. Alicia didn't miss a beat, suggesting they fund Calvara's independence, gaining a strong trading partner without declaring war. A move that was cunning and, of course, something the pure-hearted heroine would never do. Alicia was feeling more villainous-like by the second. After some royal praise, the king made his exit, leaving Alicia to breathe a sigh of relief. Duke, having witnessed it all, asked if she was nervous. She glanced up at him, thinking, yep, definitely attractive. Elsewhere, Lord Evans dropped the bomb that the Golden Rose had been found. Things were getting real. Meanwhile, Alicia found herself at a dessert table, eagerly stacking macarons on her plate. Duke, who had been staring at her the entire time, couldn't hide his smile. Curtis teased him, remarking that the Ice Prince seemed to have been thawed by an unexpected spring breeze. Later, as the sun set, Duke handed Alicia a belated birthday gift a diamond necklace that left her absolutely floored. Diamonds were worth a fortune here, way more than in her old world. She couldn't wrap her head around why he'd gift her something so extravagant. Back at the castle, the nobles gathered to watch the golden rose bloom, confirming the birth of the saint, a girl destined to guide the kingdom alongside Duke. But with every great transformation came turmoil, and they all braced for the rocky road ahead. As for Alicia, she was in her room, casually doing squats while wearing her brand new diamond necklace. And even if Duke one day fell for the heroine and demanded it back, she was already planning to look him dead in the eye and say, nope, because that's what a true villainess does.
The next day, Lisa is in the library, poring over a map when she notices how close the village of Lauren is. All I have to do is cross the forest easy peasy, right? She muses. Though she had fed the king dramatic stories about the village's grim streets and starving peasants, she admits, those tales came straight from books. I need to see it for myself. There's just one problem. Tell my dad. Ha, huh, he'd lock me in a tower. That night, Lisa stages a convincing performance of being exhausted, sneaks out under the moonlight, and ventures into the forest disguised. The darkness unsettles her more than expected, but she reassures herself, the village has a magical barrier, and I've got magic, so I'll breeze through, I hope. Pushing forward, she finds the magical wall and passes through, only to be greeted by a stench so foul it makes her gag. She spots a homeless man lying nearby and whispers, How did things get this bad? Before she can dwell on it, a voice asks, What are you doing here? You're not from around these parts. She spins around, ready for dread, but instead, she feels a strange warmth from the man. He introduces himself as Will, and despite his disheveled appearance, he seems kind. He invites her to his place, apologizing for not having much to offer. Lisa, intrigued by his politeness, asks about his past. Will reveals he once worked in the royal palace but lost his sight and was exiled after angering the wrong noble. Lisa is horrified. How could they do that to you? Will, ever philosophical, replies, We study history to make today better than yesterday. Books are fine, but if you don't use that knowledge, what's the point? His wisdom takes Lisa by surprise. I can't believe someone as brilliant as you was exiled, she says, shaking her head. Feeling a connection, she opens up about her ambition to become the greatest villain in history. Will listens patiently, as if it's the most natural thing in the world. Before leaving, Lisa promises, I'll be back. You're way too interesting. Two years later, after practicing her sword skills, Lisa frequently visits Will. One day, her brothers invite her to join them on a city outing. Albert and the boys have recently enrolled in the Magic Academy, and Lisa suspects the heroine might meet Prince Duke there, sparking the beginning of a romance. They visit a plant shop, where she strikes up a conversation with the shopkeeper, Paul, a fellow noble. He proudly explains the healing properties of plants, to which Lisa responds by rattling off facts about a rare herb called Joja, impressing Paul with her knowledge. Finally, they arrive at Prince Duke's quarters, where he playfully chastises the boys for leaving him out. When Curtis asks Lisa if there's anything she desires, she doesn't hesitate. She wants to test her sword skills, but her overprotective father and brothers have slammed the door on that dream. Big bro is having none of it. She's 10, and hello a girl. Lisa isn't buying it. There's nothing in the rules about gender, she retorts. If that's your decision, I want to hear the logical reason. But her brother shuts it down like an email on a Friday night. Don't bother, I've already decided. Furious, Lisa declares, I'm not coming back until you give me a real reason, and storms out, channeling her inner villainous. While taking a dramatic palace stroll, Lisa overhears her brother saying, She's stubborn, but if we keep saying no, one day she'll just do it herself. Their father responds cryptically, We can't tell her the real reason. Cue Lisa bursting into the room like, Were you guys talking about me? Spill the tea. Her father gives her the soft parent look and says, You're still young, my wonderful daughter. You'll find out at 15 when you enter the academy. Lisa reluctantly agrees, but her father whispers to her brother. Her sword skills are no joke. If she takes the test, things could get complicated. We've got to protect her childhood, for now. Later, Lisa's lying in bed, plotting her villain arc. I want to be the greatest villain, but I'm only ten. Moping around won't help. She decides to visit old man Will and spill all her secrets. Maybe he can help her level up cut to Lisa heading into the dark forest, wondering if Will's home. It's her first time in the village during the day, and she quickly sees why it's not on anyone's travel list poverty everywhere. She's horrified by the scene, especially when a man kicks a child hard enough to send him to the Ur if they had one. 
Lisa's about to jump in when Will yanks her back, like, I told you not to come here during the day. She protests, but Will shuts it down. Worry about yourself first. Never come here during daylight. The next morning, Lisa heads to Paul, the local herbalist, asking for Joja plants to heal that injured kid. Paul's curious but doesn't pry and hands over the plants as a gift he's trying to keep her coming back to the shop. That night, Lisa sneaks back to the village. Will tells her the boy's not fully healed, but her Joja plant mission saved his life. Lisa, feeling powerless, mutters, What's the point of becoming the greatest villain if I can't act when it matters? Determined, she vows to go all in on her studies to become history's most legendary villain. The next day, Lisa decides that magic is her ticket to power. While she's at the library talking about her ambitions, a magical aura surrounds her, and surprise, a hidden section of the library reveals itself, packed with ancient spell books. Lisa's mind is blown. This is it the key to my villainous rise. She learns that reaching level 50 magic is no small feat, only the five great magical families can usually do it, and the highest recorded level is 100. But if the heroine and duke could beat that, why not me? Lisa places a book on the floor and tries to levitate it. It floats victory, but crashes down seconds later. Frustrated but motivated, she trains like a magic-obsessed Rocky. Days later, Lisa has mastered object manipulation, a level 5 magic skill. She's proud but totally wiped out. Her body's heavy, and a headache starts pounding classic magical burnout. Just then, her dad drops in with some royal news, the king's here to see you. Lisa meets the king, who compliments her, while she wonders why all the important people are suddenly in one room. The king asks, do you love this kingdom? Lisa, caught off guard, gives her honest opinion, criticizing how the nobility works. Magical power and political authority shouldn't go hand in hand. The current system? Total waste of talent. Her bluntness shocks the nobles, and they tell her to watch her tone. The duke's surprised by her audacity, but the king, clearly intrigued, presses further. What you said applies to you too, would you give up your noble status? Lisa, totally unfazed, says, Sure, I'm cool with that. Being born into a noble family was just luck. No need to cling to it. The king is impressed. You're one of a kind, he says. As Lisa leaves, she reflects on the day's events. Exhausted, she plans to rest but promptly collapses with a fever. Duke rushes to her rescue, carrying her to her room and making sure she's taken care of. And that's how this episode wraps up. Want more? Hit subscribe and ring that notification bell to stay in the loop.